Hey, we're in the book of Zephaniah. We started it last week. We've chosen this book for uh, Black History Month. And there's a, a key reason in the very first verse of the book uh, where it talks about the man, the man Zephaniah. We spent uh, half of the message last week on this, but we're just going to capitalize on this a little bit here. It says, the word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi. Cushi is the word Cushite. It's also the word Ethiopian. Zephaniah, the son of the Ethiopian. That's what his dad's name was, Ethiopian. Or, or today it would be Sudanese, Sudanese. I believe, along with some other scholars, uh, not that I consider myself a scholar, but other scholars, uh, they have suggested from this passage, and a little background work on it, that he is a black Jew. He's a black Jew. We also noted that, as the genealogy there is, uh, that he, his, his <coughs> lineage goes back to King Hezekiah, although he is not of the royal family, still he has royal blood. And so he is the cousin to the king. But more important than all of that, he is a prophet of God. He is a prophet of God. God spoke directly to him, and it was his job to be the mouthpiece for God and to speak the message of God to other people. That is what a prophet does. And he is a prophet of God. We looked at Zephaniah the man, and we looked also at Zephaniah and his message. And his message is rather forceful, right out of the chute. He doesn't dance around. He gets right down to business, and he says, God is going to sweep all away. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. His is a message of divine justice and judgment. And uh, you've got you to think about Zephaniah for a moment. He probably wasn't the most popular guy in Jerusalem. Because here he is preaching, God is going to judge you. That's real positive, isn't it? <laughs> People don't want to hear that message. People don't want to be confronted with their sin. People don't want to be, be uh, 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 approached with the wrong in their life. They just don't want that. But right out of the chute, that's where he goes. He says God's going to sweep away everything. I've told you this story before about the Baptist preacher and the Catholic priest they were standing out in front of their two churches. Cars were zooming by and people were yelling and screaming at them because they had signs out and they were holding them up. Repent, the end is near. Cars would go by and they'd all be screaming at them. You guys are crazy. Then you'd hear screeching tires and nothing. And the one, I don't know if it was the priest or the, the Baptist preacher, he said to the other, he said, you think maybe we ought to change our signs to, instead of saying repent the end is near to say turn around bridge out ahead <laughs> Zephaniah is a guy who's out there repent the end is near he's telling him listen the end is near God is going to judge this world one day we're all going to stand before God and that's, that's kind of his message here so today he says, listen, be silent. It's an onomatopoeia, that word. It's the word hush in Hebrew. <laughs> hush. He puts it here as be silent. Probably the way he meant it was, hey, shut up and listen. <laughs> you get my picture? Because I think he's a bold preacher. Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. We're going to see in a few moments the day of the Lord is a day of judgment. The day of judgment is near. It's upon you. It's imminent. But before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about prophecy because it gets a little confusing when you go through prophetic books because you don't know what sometimes he's talking about. All right? You ever been there? Say, I'm not sure what he's talking about here. Prophecy is a lot like viewing mountains from the distance. I don't know if you've ever been driving across you know, Colorado and coming to the Rocky Mountains and you see the, 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 the outline of the mountains all at once. And it looks like one solid mountain, right? And that's the way it kind of looks. But it's actually a ridge of mountains. There's one mountain in front of the other, but from the distance, they look like it's all just one mountain. Prophecies are like prophetic mountain peaks. And from the distance of the prophet, they all seem to blend together. So in this one, there's actually two ranges 
that have blended so together so that there's a first range and a second range. And then there's the prophet. And from the prophet's perspective, as he's looking, he doesn't necessarily see those two ranges. He sees it all as one, but there's two ranges there. And he's describing two things at the same time. And he doesn't really, from his perspective, always understand that until later in the scriptures we get clarification of what it is. Now, if I were to take a side view of this, you'd see that the first peak and the second peak are got some distance between them. It's like the first coming and the second coming of Christ. Some passages in the Bible have them both and the very same verse. You have first coming, second coming, and you don't notice that until you get New Testament information telling you how it all was laid out. From the side view, we got these two peaks, and in the actual time, there's a great distance between them. And a prophet, he's seeing them, though. He doesn't see the valley in between. And this valley can be really great because in, inside this valley between the Babylonian invasion he's about to describe and the final end-time war that he's about to describe, there's a lot of time in between. In fact, the whole church age is in there. We're living between the first event that was the Babylonian invasion and we're living in, in between the, the, the second event, which is the final coming gar- Armageddon and all of that. And we're in that valley in between. But the prophet, he sees, he sees them both. Now, the second thing I want to talk about is the theology of the term day. The term day itself, the word day, means evening and morning. Did you get how I said that? Evening and morning. We think of day and night, but the Semitic thought was evening and morning. It goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and it was evening and morning, day one. Evening and morning, because in the Semitic mind, the dark comes before the dawn, night before day. And so whenever they count time, even to this very day, the Sabbath day begins on Friday evening at 6 o'clock and goes to Saturday on 6 o'clock. Even to this day, they practice that evening and morning. Now, the Lord's Day is a reference in Revelation 1.10 to Sunday because we worship on the Lord's Day. Almost the close of every service I say, may the Lord bless you on the Lord's Day. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. It's the Lord's Day. Today's His day. Now, the next concept is the Day of the Lord. And the Day of the Lord is not a 24-hour period of time. It's like, I say, in the Day of George Washington. Well, does that mean on one specific 24-hour day? No, that means in the time, that period, that period. And that's the way the day of the Lord is used. And and it's used in the sense that there's going to be a coming time where it's going to be darkness and gloom. And we're going to see that as we go through the passage today. The New Testament tells us that's going to be a seven-year period. In fact, part of the Old Testament does too, of tribulation. That's going to be gloom and doom. It's going to be terrible, judgment, war. And it's going to be followed by a time of light. And that time of light is the millennium, a thousand years, excuse me, the day of the Lord is like a thousand and seven years long, give or take an extra few days, because the Bible talks about setting it up and that kind of thing. So uh, I could probably figure out what the Bible says, but that's good enough, a thousand and seven years long, close enough. There's another reference to day, and it's again a period of time, it's called the day of Christ, it's found in Philippians chapter 1. Uh, and that the Lord may keep you until the day of Christ. The day of Christ is when the church is raptured and goes to the judgment seat of Christ and we receive rewards for what we have done or loss of rewards for what we have not done for the Lord. And then we return to the earth when the Lord returns to the earth for the, the day of the Lord, the millennium. And that's called the day of Christ. And so we got another day in the Bible, theology of the day. You didn't realize that the word day was so theologically packed did you? (laughs) There's another one. The day of God is mentioned in 2 Peter 3.12, and it is about eternity to come. And so we got eternity as the day of God, and this is is the term day. It's in the Bible. It's the way it's laid out. Now, if I were to put these all together, I'd have you got a 24-hour day, and then there's the day of the Lord that we keep repeating down through time, And a day is going to come when we'll no longer celebrate the day of the Lord because we're going to be raptured out of here and we're going to go to heaven while the day of the Lord is going on on earth, tribulation, the tribulation comes after the rapture of the church and then the millennium. But while the tribulation is going on, the day of Christ is going on in heaven we're being rewarded for what we've done in our lives. Then we return with the, the Lord to the earth 
for a thousand years, a millennium, and after that, this world is destroyed, a new heaven and a new earth, and we go into the day of God. Whew, that's all in the theology of the day. This is all background for today's message. I hope you took really good notes, or you've got photographic memory and all, all of that. You'll catch on. It gets good. Why do we need to know all this stuff? We see prophecy is nothing more than history that just hasn't been written yet in our history books. It is God who providentially ran the whole universe for all of history up to this point in which we live. He is also the God that's going to run it into the future. And it's history before it's been written in the history books. And this is what God will do. It is as certain as everything that historically has already happened. And what is going to happen applies to me today. It applies to me today. He wants me to take application. So the whole Bible, from beginning to end, even the prophetic elements, he wants to apply to me, to you. Wow. Having said all that, I want to look at a passage that tells me that it's true. In 2 Peter 3.10, it says this. But the day of the Lord, oh, that's what we're talking about, the day of darkness, the day of light, tribulation, and the millennium. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar that's at the end of the day of the Lord. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. This sounds just like Zephaniah. I'm going to sweep it all away. It's all going to be destroyed. He says, since everything will be destroyed this way, what kind of people ought you to be? Whoa. You see what he's saying? Future judgment. I should live my life to realize one day this God is going to sweep everything away and I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to give an account to God for my life. He said, you ought to live holy, godly lives as you look forward to the day of God, that's eternity, and speed, it's coming. Whoa, it's coming. We'll look a little bit more at that towards the end. Today we have this call to silence. Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. That's what he's preaching to the people. He's preaching that the day of the Lord is, is near, and, and he says to those in Jerusalem, he says, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. All right, those of you reading through the Bible, and if you're on schedule, you've been reading through the book of Leviticus, and you've read about the sacrifices. And the sacrifice is where you put something to death. You kill it. A time of destruction is coming. The Lord here, though, has prepared a sacrifice. Most theologians believe he's saying that, Israel, you are the sacrifice. You're going down. You're going to be destroyed. And this is what happens, he adds. He has consecrated those he has invited. To consecrate means to be holy. In the book of Isaiah, it tells us that the Lord calls the Babylonians my holy servants. What? You see, the word holy means he set them apart for a purpose. He said, I've set apart the, the Babylonians for the purpose to destroy you. I'm going to use them as my instrument. They're going to be like my priests to sacrifice you on the altar with judgment. Wow. Zephaniah is probably not a real popular guy because he's telling the people, you are going down. Who wants to hear that? Who wants to hear that? So God has invited the Babylonians to come and destroy us? On the day of, of the Lord's sacrifice, he says, I will punish princes and the king's sons and all those clad in foreign clothes. He said, look, kings are going down, but notice he says it's the king's sons and not good King Josiah. I think that is very interesting. King Josiah was a godly king. And God says kings are going down, but it's the king's sons, not this king, because this king is a good king. He's the one that brought revival. He brought the, the law back. And he brought worship of the, whole, the true and living God, Jehovah. He's the one that got rid of the Baals and the Asherahs and the Molech. He got rid of all of that. And he focused on the Lord. And, and he says here, on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish. It, it, I'm going to destroy those who do not follow the true and living God. Listen, on that day, now the expression that day is an abbreviation of saying on the day of the Lord. 
often through the scriptures, you'll find he'll just say, on that day, and you've got to read the context because the context is the day of the Lord. He's just shortened it. On that day of the Lord, I will punish all who avoid stepping on the threshold, who fill the temple of their gods with violence and deceit. This is something that uh, goes back to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, I believe it's in chapter 5, where they had captured the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the temple of Dagon. And the Philistines, God Dagon, in the morning had fallen over. They pick him back up. You read a little bit further, and the, the next day he falls over. Only the, What happens is Dagon's head gets broke off and his hands get broke off. And so they got a broken idol in the front of, of, of the Ark of the Covenant. And they say, we got to get rid of this Ark of the Covenant. He's killing our God. <laughs> and so they give it back to the Israelites. But it says in the text there, in 1 Samuel 5, that because of that, they would not step on the threshold, you know, the, the board or the, 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 the bottom plate of the doorway. They, they would step over it. Why? They were superstitious. Superstition. Superstition creeps into our lives, too. Believe it or not. I have a stepson who thought I was a jinx to the kids winning their games, whether it was hockey, tennis, you name it, basketball, because the games I showed up at, they lost. So I am the jinx. <laughs> Come on. We all have our little superstitions, you know? It could be as weird as I got to turn the light off two times. Why? Well, I just got to do that. They had their superstitions, and it crept in. And he said, you guys are so superstitious. Why are you not trusting the true and the living God? You think all that nonsense has anything to do with it? I am the God of providence. I run, and I control, and I operate my universe. On that day, I'll punish all those who are superstitious. Whoa. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will go up from the fish gate. It doesn't mean anything to you, does it? Fish gate? Well, in old Jerusalem, the fish gate was on the north side of the city. Wailing from the new quarter. It's believed that that was just inside that gate. That's the new quarter area. Some believe that it was all the way down to the market district, which is uh, where the Sea Word Valley is. That's the Tyropian Valley. They believe maybe that was the market district. We don't know for sure. But what he's saying is the city, in the city, everyone's going to be crying. He goes on and he says, there's going to be a loud crash. Wail, you who live in the market district, all your merchants will be wiped out. All who trade with silver will be ruined. What he's talking about? He's talking about financial collapse. There's going to be a market crash. If I read Revelation 17 correctly, there's going to be an end-time market crash where the whole world crashes. The whole world, worse than the Great Depression, and it takes less than 30 minutes. The whole world comes to its knees. Wow. Wait till everything's gone totally digital and the whole digital thing gets wiped out and everybody's got absolutely zero or nothing. It'll happen in less than 30 minutes, believe me. Wow. Wow. He said, on that day, the, day of the Lord, Lord's judgment, he says, at that time... I will search. The Lord is going to search Jerusalem with a lamp and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on the dregs. That's an idiom for complacent. Who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Oh, nothing's going to happen. Don't worry. Everything's going to go on like normal. In fact, we find that very same thing in 2 Peter where we read earlier about the day of the Lord. They will say, where is his coming? Because he's saying that, hey, there's, people are going to be saying, like in the days of Noah, they, they got really complacent. There's that weirdo Noah, man. He's still building that ark. It has never rained. You realize it never rained before that? A dew came up every day and watered the earth. It never rained. And, and, and so, hey, that wacko. He's built, look at that. Did you see the size of it? You know how far it is to the ocean? I don't know how he plans to get it there. He, he was mocking. He said, as it was then, they're going to say in the future, our times, where is his coming as he promised? 
Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it did since the beginning of creation. Come on, if Jesus is coming, he should have been here by now. Isn't that what they say? And you still think he's coming? Of course I do. I don't grow complacent. As I read the scriptures, I really feel I'm in the, the end times. I'm coming. We're on the verge of his return. It's closer now than it's ever been. That only makes sense because it's closer now than it's ever been. Anyway, they were complacent. He said, the day of the Lord is a time of destruction. Their wealth will be plundered. Your money is absolutely useless. Their houses will be demolished. They will build houses, but they will not get to live in them. They will plant vineyards, but never drink from the, the, the wine from the vine. That, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. At this point, I call this a second call to silence. The word be silent doesn't occur, but he says, the great day of the Lord is near, near and coming. Before he called it the, the day of the Lord, now he says, the great day of the Lord. It, it, it's kind of like in Revelation, we get to the, the sixth uh, seal, and he, and he breaks that one open in, in Revelation chapter 6, uh, and there, there it says in the 17th verse, the great day of their wrath has come. It's great wrath, great wrath Ooh, has come. Here, here he says, the great day, something about this, it's getting more intense is what he's saying. It's coming and it is near and it is coming quickly. By quickly, he means simply it is Im impending judgment that is imminent. It's about to happen. It's about to happen. He sees on the horizon the Babylonians coming. Now, if I'm correct that reign of Josiah, you know, and Zephaniah are speaking around 620 B.C. And the first wave of the Babylonians is in 605 B.C. It was 15 years away when he said this. This is what he's saying. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise. Oh, I like that. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, and you know what it says in verse 8? In verse 8, it says, a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Whew. God doesn't count time like we do. When he says it's near and it's going to happen soon, listen, if he's even talking about our age right now, then it's only been like three days. From the time he made this prophecy to right now, on the scale of the Lord's calendar. He said, but the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. Boy, this sounds just like Zephaniah. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Swept away is what Zephaniah says. Wow. Notice this is all future tense to Peter. So this all didn't happen in Zephaniah's day. Part of it happens in Zephaniah's time, and part of it's going to happen in a future day, because this is prophecies with two peaks. And, and some call it partial, part then, more later. Some call it double fulfillment, some then, some later. But it is still coming. Judgment day is coming. It is near, he says. It is near. So he says, listen, don't, don't speak, just listen, listen. Listen, the cry of the day of the Lord will be bitter and the shout of a warrior is there. There's going to be war. In the first half of the tribulation, after the church is raptured out of the, this world, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars that Jesus spoke of in Matthew chapter 24. Listen, the cry of the day of the Lord will be bitter. The shouting of the warrior will be there. It's a day of wrath. That day will be a day of wrath, like Revelation chapter 6, verse 17 says, the great day of the wrath. I mean, it's great wrath of, of the Lamb and the Father on the throne. It's their wrath, a day of distress and anguish, a, a day of trouble and ru a ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpets and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. There's going to be a war that's going to culminate in Jerusalem to sack the city. I can't imagine that Jeremiah, uh, I mean, <coughs> Zephaniah here is uh, probably not the most popular guy in town. The sky is falling, is what he's saying. 
It's coming soon. It's coming soon. It's distressing. I will bring distress. Distress has a synonym. The synonym is tribulation. I will bring tribulation on the people and they will, be, they will walk like blind men. They won't even see it coming. Because they've sinned against the Lord and God has just given them over to their sinfulness. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like filth. They're going to be utterly destroyed. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Wow. You can't buy it off. There's no good thing that you can do. It is still true. You can't buy your way to heaven. You can't buy your way out of it. You have to accept the Lord. He says, on the day of the Lord's wrath, in fire of his jealousy, the whole world will be consumed. That's just like we read in 2 Peter. He, may, he will make a sudden end of all who live there. I want to go back to 2 Peter because this isn't just a Babylonian invasion back then. Although he's got that in view because just 15 years later, the Babylonians come knocking on their door and all this happens to them on a local level. But Peter says this in 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come. It's still, still to come. The ultimate fulfillment is still ahead of us, like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare, just like Zephaniah said. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought we to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives. See, that's why the prophecy was given. So you would say, you know, this, this God... It's a God who's going to call an account of what I have done with my life. As you look forward to the day of God, when the heavens, are, he's going to go on, and speed is coming. The day will bring about destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in heat. The word elements is like the very building blocks of creation. And what is that? We think of it as atoms. And you release an atom and what happens? You have this nuclear explosion. There is fire. There is, there is destruction. It's like all the elements of creation melt down because God is bringing about a new heaven and a new earth I believe he goes on to say that. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of the righteous. Who's the righteous? Those who know Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They are the righteous. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, at peace with him. Wow, spotless and blameless. Live like you know Jesus every day. I don't know, you get to the end of this, you kind of fell along a little hopeless, huh? Oh my goodness, you see what's coming? He says, be silent, shh, hush. Judgment is coming. We're doomed. Wow. That's not a very positive, uplifting message. Oh, until you get to that third chapter. <laughs> Our memory verse. This is so powerful. The Lord your God is with you. None of this is going to happen to you. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He's going to rescue you because you know him. You're not going through any of this. All this judgment stuff. All your judgment was taken on the cross. Isn't it great? He will take great delight in you. That's what I want to focus on just for a moment. He will take great delight delight in you. He said, well, that's an interesting picture. There's Jesus with a bride. Yeah, because the word delight here is only used like four times, and it's used here in Isaiah 62 as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. Now, I, I'm the preacher, and I've done several weddings in, in my years of being a preacher, and, and I've always come in with the, with the groom, and he stands right here, you know, in the front, and uh, we look down the aisle, doesn't matter, I've been through all our churches, we do the same routine every time, and the bride makes her appearance, and I look at the groom. 
And he is smiling ear to ear. It's like, wow. She's mine. She's going to be mine forever. <laughs> you just see that all over the guy's face, right? You see that? I think that's what's going on here. As the bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. <laughs> I just think this is great. I agree. All this judgment is coming, but... You're the bride. You know what the bridegroom does? He protects his bride. He'll lay down his life for that bride. He loves that bride. That's you. That's me. Come on now. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. How did Jesus love the church? He tells us in the verse. And he gave himself up for her. He said, whoa, this is my bride. I'm stepping in. I'm taking her place. I'm dying for her. This is awesome stuff. I'm taking all her judgment, all her pain. Listen, he says, he gave himself up for her. And here's the reason. He's got a purpose to make her holy. I want her to be pure lily white. <laughs> he cleanses her with the washing of the water through his word. He speaks into her life kindness, loving. He's, he's protecting. He says, honey, you don't have a thing to worry about. And he steps in. He takes the place. He takes it all. Why does he do that? To present himself as a radiant, to present, present her to himself as a radiant church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemishes, the very thing Peter had been saying about us. Wow. That we would live a holy and blemishless life. Wow. Our relationship with Jesus Christ is crucial that I live a holy, spotless, clean life. I can't do it without Jesus, can't. I can't do it. You can't do it. Our hope is in Jesus now. Our hope in the future is Jesus then. Our hope always, always, always is in Jesus. Now, I've jumped to the end of the book, and that's, the, I don't know, if you're ever feeling down, just jump to the end. Read chapters, Revelation 20 and 21, and you find that the angel in chapter, Revelation chapter 21, he, he says to John, come up, and I will show, come up and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And so then he's taken up on a mountain peak and he looks up even higher. He's on, on the top of the world, so to speak. And he looks up and here is this city, a holy city, New Jerusalem, descending God, down from God out of heaven. Why? The old heaven and the old earth are, are passed away. But he says, look, it's the bride of Christ. What? That's our new home. That's our home. No, home. The rest of the chapter is spent describing how he has prepared this place for us. You see, our hope is not in anything here that is temporary. Our hope is in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who has gone into heaven to prepare a place for us. And when the time is ready, he's coming for his bride to take his bride back home with him forever and ever. Wow. Hallelujah. I come back to Zechariah 3.17. You've got to memorize this verse. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save and he will take great, great delight in you like you are his bride. He will take great delight. He's got a happy smile on his face about you because you know Jesus. Because you know Jesus. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Zephaniah spends so much time on the judgment part and then he just focuses in on this one little verse and just overwhelms us. It overwhelms us on how great your salvation is. Help us, Lord, to walk closer to Jesus, to realize that you're with us. You're mighty to save, and you delight over us. Lord, when we have those thoughts in our minds, it pumps us up. <coughs> it strengthens us. 
to walk with you. Help us do that. In Christ's name, amen.